Hey fam, we're going to read How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind. Chapter 3, Defining Africa. It is an odd but understandable question to ask just how African was Athanasius, who grew up in Egypt, how Africa was Augustine, who grew up in Numidia. It is descriptively correct to say that <clears throat> Cyprian was an African. However valuable their contributions to Western thought may be, their status as genuine Africans has for odd reasons remained under a cloud and will until this question is candidly faced. The argument for the recovery of early African Christianity cannot easily proceed unless it, ha unless it can be shown that these great intellects were truly Africans, not just in geographical sense, but in spirit and in temperament, not just, in temp not just temporary day trippers, but born and bred in Africa. Indigenized in families living through generations of African life. I believe that there is nothing phony in their African Christian, Christian identity. Many were willing to die for that identity. Establishing the indigenous depth of early African Christianity. A demeaning prejudice was crept into historical lore that these great figures were not Africans at all, merely Europeans in disguise. This is a fairly recent Western intellect prejudice. It suggests that the African intellect, intellectual tra tradition cannot even claim its own sons and daughters, especially if they happened to have been articulate or if they were sufficiently astute to speak in the common international academic, commercial, and political languages of the day. According to that bias, the greater, the greater those competencies, the less African they would be. The more provincial, the more truly African. The more cosmopolitan, the less African. We do not want to go there. If so, the African continent cannot embrace its own, even Didymus, the blind, or the great desert mother Sarah, or the tall brothers of Wadiel, Natron. Even more ludicrous is the claim that the African continent cannot include Thibian born Pacomius or Numidian born Op Optatus. Whether Tertullian and Cyprian and Augustine learned everything from Rome can easily be answered on the basis of impartial textual analysis. These Africans were being seriously read in Rome during their lifetimes when they were living in Africa because they were teaching in a way pertinent and useful to Rome and the, awake, and the awakening wider European ethos. Among the most decisive things Augustine personally learned in Italy, according to his own confessions, 8.6.14, was the impact made upon him by hearing from Pontius Pontitianus of Holy Life of Antony of the African Desert, written by the African patriarch Athanius and Thansius. Look up, look at a map of Egypt and review the geographical range of pastoral responsibility of Athanasius and Athanasius. It was the whole of the lower delta and the middle Nile Valley with diocesan responsibilities reaching beyond the first cataracts with their widely varied subcultures and languages. His responsibility was not just with Alexandrians who spoke Greek. In any case, the ethnographic evidence shows that a large proportion of Alexandrians were themselves Egyptian, Egyptian ethnics, many of whom doubtless spoke several languages, Syriac, Proto-Arabic, Aramaic, Nilotic variants, and etc., in order to deal with commercial realities in that greatest of international port cities. Antony of the desert lived most of his hundred plus years in a very remote part of the far eastern desert of Egypt, 
Many days journey from any Greek speaking city. It is exact to simply identify Antony as an Alexandrian without remembering the mountain cave where he founded Anchorite monasticism. Athanasius spent long periods of time in the Egyptian desert in hiding or in forced exile. Only seated prejudices can blithely charge these great leaders were not genuinely African. Almost every turn in African Christian his history is misjudged if it lives by the premise that Europeans have a natural advantage built into their intellectual DNA. This bungled premise misreads the significance of the inland African struggles of Coptic Christianity for centuries following the Arab conquest. The stereotype also misjudges the depth of the encounter of early African Christianity, of Christianity to the Nilotic speaking traditional African religions in the southern part of the Nile, which extends all the way to the present day Sudan and Uganda. It considers as negligible the subtle dialectical forms of cultural interaction between Christianity and African cultures that occur gradually over centuries of shared hazards and mutual learning. There is an enduring pre-Christian traditional African religious past in the North Africa during the first, during the entire first Christian millennium. Pharaonic, Proto-Nubian, Libyan, Capsian, and Ghanaian, reaching far back into Africa, African prehistory. Pre it remains indigenously African, even while being militarily forced to adapt to <clears throat> multiple col uh, colonial coercions. Early Christianity had to deal with these deeply ingrained traditional African cultures in the isolated villages of Maghreb and Nile. Not only with Greco-Roman civ civ civic religion, it was the strength of of that traditional African religion transformed by Christianity that stood up to idolatrous Roman, Roman civic religion. The study of comparative metaphors makes clear how the motifs of an, an ancient pharaonic religions such as spiritual ascent and eternal life were echoed and included in the works of Origen and Hansius and Pacomias. The stereotyping of African Hellenism as non-African. The stereotype of Alexandria as a small olive patch of Greece planted on the coast of Africa by aliens became less and less true with each century after Bishop Demetrius. This stereotype of Alexandria as a totally Greek city forgets just how international the huge African metropolis had become as early as the time of Philo. The multi-ethnic trading interests which had established wide routes of commerce to and from Alexandria incorporated and prized the cultures of the Nile far south of the Delta and the cultures of the Maghreb far to the west. The fact that some Africans were Greek speaking did not make them any less African. Similarly, to speak Latin in Libyan port city did not make the ethnicity Berber speaker of Sabratha any less African. To define Theban and Pacomian monastic, <clears throat> I know how to say this, monasticism. Essentially, as Greek is to misunderstand its language, its worldview, and its social location. Even if its leaders wrote publicly in Greek, they continued to speak to a Nilotic culture in Nilotic metaphors. Even the leaders in Alexandria had the Nile Delta and the Valley to deal with commercially, and it had a culture dating more than a thousand years older than Alexandria. So by what magic could Alexandria be cut adrift from its continental context and reality?
If modern African Christianity had been better grounded in ancient African ecumenical teachings, it would have never, <clears throat> excuse me, it would never have felt compelled to be defensive about the Hellenistic voices of its own African tradition. For Hellenism in Africa had become profoundly Africanized over the very long um, period, period of time of some 20 generations before origin, modern Africa, excuse me, modern African Christians need to get this straight in order to recover their actual history identity as African. Otherwise, Africa needlessly deprives itself of its own heritage. Scientific inquiry into the ethnicity of early African Christian writers. Whenever these matters are discussed, the speculative question soon arises as the ethnic identity and even the skin color of writers like Tertullian, Cyprian, Optatus, Veracundus, and Augustine. In this, in this arena, the recent paleographic inquiry into funerary inscriptions and family names bears interesting details pertinent to this question. The evidence shows that there was a gradual transition of Berber, Libyan, and Punic family names into their Latin or Greek equivalents during the centuries prior to and during the growth of Christianity. That did not affect their ethnicity or skin color, only their names. Thus, it would, be, it would not be extraordinary if a person with tribal and family ties teaching thousands of years back into indigenous African history might have a Latin sounding name. It is likely that Augustine had a mother with Berber background from a family that converted to Christianity at least a generation before his birth in 354. Monica would not have become any less eth ethnically African just because she married a military officer with a Roman sounding name. Augustine was born and raised in a remote inland Nub Numidian town, Thagast, with mixed racial stock. The rock carvings from Neolithic times in Numidia show occupation dating back 10,000 years. Among Augustine's known family and friends were people who had Berber, Punic, and Numidian, Roman, and even Libyan names. Christians living before Athanasius were long settled in the Middle Nile as far south as Oxyrhynchus and the Phaeum. Athanasius, according to his own statement, came from an environment of very modest means, not from foreign elite. As a child, he was noticed playing on the beach by Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, and virtually adopted as if an orphan, according to an early tradition. This leaves entirely mute the genetics of the great leader, but there are many indications that he kept close and active ties with his middle Nile ethnics of many varieties who spoke proto-Coptic or cognate Nilotic based languages. When he was forced into exile, he sought refuge in the desert areas far away from the cosmopolitan Greek-speaking urban ethos of Alexandria. There can be no doubt that Origen grew up in Africa, wrote much of his work in Africa, and then transmitted his extensive African library and teaching to Caesarea Palestina. It is a strange and demeaning criterion to apply to Origen the odd assumption that because he was adept at many languages, he was not very African. By this metaphor, by, the, by his metaphors, the greatest biblical interpreter of early Christianity shows many indications of being indigenously African, whatever his specific ethnicity.
Scholars are thus challenged with the puzzling complication of delving into the mutation of family names and place names associated with the most important contributors to early African Christianity. Further paleographical, archaeological, and ling linguistic evidences may gradually yield more light on these speculations. Scientific studies of DNA, mitochondrial genes, and, mito <clears throat> and migration patterns are being refined and may, in due time, provide more discernment. If the writings of Philo, Senecius, Victor of Vita, and Chanute of a tripe had all been written in France, they would be called European, but they were not. They were written in Africa, so why shouldn't they be called African? There is a prejudice at work here. Suspect anything of intellectual value that comes from African content as having some sort of secret European origin. What convincing argument can be set forth to deny Africanness? How black were the Christians of North America? Black enough if blackness is understood in terms of intergenerational suffering and oppression? If black is defined by a color, a trip to Numidia or Nubia or Ethiopia settles the chromatological argument. But Orthodox Christians do not admit skin color as a criterion for judging Christian truth. Never have, never will. African Christianity is not primarily a racial story, but a confessional story of, a, of martyrs and <clears throat> lives lived by faith, active in love. To judge truth by race itself, heretical, and that truth was the first clearly formulated in ecumenical Christianity from the Jerusalem Council and the early baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch and following. And that truth itself became a standard assumption of early African Christianity. Hence, for the purposes of this discussion, if a text was written in Africa, it will be treated as African. That is a is a simple, straightforward criterion, much clearer than speculations about ethnicity or pigment as decisive criterion for Africanness. If to be an African Christian requires that one be a particular skin color, what would rule out all Orthodox Christians of all hues who would quickly disavow such unorthodox and counter-biblical requirements. The purveyors of myopia. Why has such a simple point been resisted? There is a dismal and ironic reason. Many modern interpreters of Africa have been tendentiously shaped by Euro-American academic conjectures. In seeking the anticipated legitimacy that comes from higher education, African scholars during the period in which independence was being fought for, fought for fell all too easily into the trap of the, of the idealizing, romanticizing, and libera, libera, liberalizing motifs so familiar to Western modern traditions. They are not to be criticized for seeking the best education available to them. But the best education available to them was still highly imperfect. With all the limitations of the chief failures of modernity, autonomous individualism, hedonic narcissism, moral relativism, and reductive naturalism, None are characteristic of the African spirit. We can hardly find these prejudices against, African, against Africa voiced anywhere in Christian history until we get to the 19th century, especially to the writings of the French Enlightenment, German idealism, and British empiricism. It was not until Hegel, Troch, Harnack, Bauer, and these prejudices became so standardized 
that they were accepted without question by educated Westerners and by Western educated Africans. These were the main catalysts followed not only by the Western liberals, but oddly also by the Catholic and evangelical traditions of historical scholarship. The main distortions prevailing in modern African theology have their roots in the Eurocentric tradition from Hegel to Harnack that penetrated deeply into the assumptions of Barr, Boltman, and Tillich. The extensive historical studies of these German theologians were not corrected by British or American history, historical theologians. They have regrettably stood as normative for many liberals, even evangelicals and Catholics. Along the way, modern theology has lost track of the re revered early African assessment <coughs> of the saints and martyrs and confessors. The African ancestors were viewed as myths to be demythologized, not as valued social communitarian realities. Why have these dynamics not been better understood? The historical answer is that Euro-American intellectuals have transmitted these ideas to Africa where they have been camouflaged as if to assume that these prejudices were themselves genuinely African. Here is a crucial test question. Compare these two lists. One, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Marx, Freud, and number two, Tertullian, Cyprian, Athanasius, and Augustine. Now ask, which list is more African? I can tell you, and this is me talking out of my own thoughts. It's easier for me to pronounce number two, Tertullian, Cyprian, Athanasius, Augustine. These, and I'm African American. And number one is Rousseau, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud. I mean, this number two list sounds more it hits my spirit more. Anyway, back to the real, the, what's more important. Now, ask which list is more African. Now ask which list has more deeply affected the past generation of African intelligentsia and of scholarship and in and about Africa and even of much African theolog theology. A review of references in their books will show that African that the African list is quoted with far less frequency by a huge factor than the European list than the European list. It is thus evident how far African interpreters have gone in accommodating to European thinkers with minimal empathy for African sensibilities, metaphors, and premises. When we read modern works purporting to be African theology, this is why we find Rousseau, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud quoted far more frequently than Tertullian, Cyprian, Athanasius, or Augustine. The former list contains key names that gained increasing clout during the peace and justice movement of the 1960s that fueled the anger and resentment of the nationalistic critics against Christianity in Africa. Regrettably, the ecumenical leaders who should have been grounded in ancient ecumenical teaching offered the pretense that the modern ecumenical movement was now to be grounded in post-enlightenment modernism, not the consensus, consensus of the apostolic witness, witnesses. These pseudo-ecumenists undermined the weakened liberalizing mainstream Protestant missions of the churches in the, in the villages of Africa. Some then became compulsively ashamed of the apostolic witness and actively accommodative to modern Euro-American fadism. Fadism. Had they been more classically African, Christian, Christianly speaking, and less narrowly European in their advocacy, they would have served the ecumenical cause in Africa better than they did. 
The African seedbed hypothesis requires textual demonstration. A new task is now incumbent upon emerging African Christianity to embrace its own brilliant intellectual heritage, to reclaim what is rightfully its own. This can only be done properly by showing through critical analysis how this forgetfulness has occurred and through hard evidence how the facts confirm the extraordinary extraordinary intellectual gener, gener, generativity of early African believers. There need be no apologies, only factual clarity leading toward verification. Let the data speak louder than the prejudices. But this evidence has not yet been persuasively stated in a global audience in a convincing way. My core hypothesis is that much intellectual history flowed south to north, from Numidia to Sicily to France and Italy. It flowed from the Nile to the Euphrates and the Danube. It flowed from Pelusium to Gaza to Cappadocia. An unfinished task of the coming era of African scholarship is to set forth the inter intermediary evidence textually, archaeologically, and paleographically. There is ample evidence available that the seeds of African orthodoxy have been lifted by high winds to distant northern climes. Only much later have they returned to Africa in western guise. These channels may be tracked textually. While there are centuries of research that have been devoted to European influence on Africa, there remains a dearth of research on the impact of the intellectual movements of Africa to Europe. This is a question that has been lying fallow for a very long time. This problem may await some future decade to be undertaken, but it will be undertaken eventually. The evidence is already there and consistently understated. Much more will be uncovered by diligent inquiry. The crisis of African theological identity may be just the catalyst to cue off this recovery. The evidence will be more convincing if presented by African scholars. Insofar as it has the appearance of being an instrument of Western power, it will be easily and rightly dismissed. The evidence can be dug out by anyone, but its public pre presentation needs an African voice. The evidence belongs to the global Christianity. Its messengers must protect it from being distorted or prematurely snubbed. A case in point, the circuitous path from Africa to Ireland to Europe and then back to Africa. The Christianity that was once indigenously present throughout North, North Africa was forced to flee from Vandal and Arab invasions. These refugees were exiled and became implanted in the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries in Spain, Gaul, Sardinia, Sicily, Italy, and Britain. Their influence spread largely through quiet, inconspicuous, scholarly, monastic communities formed under Pacomian and Augustinian rules out of Egypt and Numidia. The best example is the unexpected trajectory of monasticism from Africa to Ireland to Europe and then back to Africa in a thousand year cycle. This is the text, this is the next surprising step of our investigation. How Africa influenced Ireland and how the Irish monks then shaped the formation of the medieval Europe. The history of the planning of African monasticism in Ireland is one of the most astonishing of all the stories of the preservation of civilization. The trajectory was from Africa to Sicily to the Isle of Larens to Ireland. This transit 
happened before the Arab conquest, but its consequences became critical, critical only after the Arab conquest. The tiny island of Lerins, just off southern, just off the southern French coast, played a decisive role. There, as early as the Council of Ephesus, 431, the African-influenced monastics were spreading the Pacomanian pattern of monasticism, monast, monasticism from Africa to Europe. These monastics were honoratious, Caesarius of Arles, Salvian of Marseille, Marseilles, I'm trying to say, went to Marseilles, okay, Salvian of Marseilles, and Vincent of Larens. They set the stage for the coming of Irish monks to Europe. It may be that Patrick of Ireland was among these monks who studied at Larens, as the ancient tradition suggests, a hypothesis that invites th thorough revisiting. How the Irish would take the lead in this movement is itself a longer story than I can tell here. But his, it has been told winsomely by Thomas Cahill in How the Irish Saved Civilization. The threads of evidence of African liturgical and exegetical, exegetical influences in Ireland need to be carefully unpacked by astute historians who know the pertinent languages, Coptic, Gaelic, Latin, and French, and have sufficient access to the archival collections scattered throughout the Mediterranean, Ireland, the United Kingdom, and the universities and monasteries of Europe. This is a daunting task of historical investigation into primary source documentation. If undertaken by young African scholars, it will take on deeper plausibility for Africans. If undertaken, excuse me, exclusively by Northern Hemisphere investigators, it is more likely to be tainted with the marks of post-enlightenment his, his, historiography. Ideally, it should be an international consortium of scholars, which is what the website on early African Christianity, earlyafricanchristianity.com, seeks to encourage and supply with a steady flow of active research information. The period of the 5th through 10th centuries, though very lively, is still dubbed the Dark Ages. This says more about our darkness than about the events occurring at that time. A shroud of obscurity hangs over the Western culture during these times. These centuries are least studied with less empathy and less textual information than any, of, any others of Western history. For decades since Edmund Gibbon, they have been stereotyped as a period of vast cultural deterioration. The heart of the evidentiary task is to show the path of monastic piety and African scholarship from the Nile and Medjerda valleys in flight north to Sardinia, Sicily, Europe, and especially Ireland. Who besides the Irish will take up this astonishing investigation? Why not Africans? By the time of Colombo and Fenian, the centers of the monastics, monastic learning had shifted from Africa to Ireland, and from there they migrated to the Rhine Valley to the Bobbio Abbey, Italy, and the Abbey of St. Gaul, Switzerland, and finally the Po and the Rhone Valleys of northern Italy and southern Franco in a great clockwise circular movement. The most surprising chapter of the story, however, is the return to Africa of classic Christianity, that same early ecumenical Christianity that was so well formed so early in Africa. By this time, the mutations that occurred in Europe made it unrecognizable as African. So the exegesis, exegesis and theology and liturgy 
that were first refined in Africa finally returned to Africa in the prayer books and penitential practices of both Catholics and Protestants, but in forms that seemed unrecognizable as African. Indeed, by the time it returned, it seemed alien to Africa, like Odysseus reclaiming his bed. Now, you know, that's exactly what Dr. Henrik Clark said. I, I heard his video two years ago, and he said, we had our own religion, and the European took it from us and repackaged it and sold it back to us. That's the way he put it, and that's, that's what just got said in a nutshell. And um, it's just very interesting. It is easy to establish this path textually from Ireland on. What is harder to establish is the path from Medjurda, monasticism, fleeing from Vandal Africa to the havens of nearby Sicily, Sardinia, Province, and Navarre, and in due course arriving along with the Patrick on Irish shore, shores. This is the hazardous path traveled mainly by those monks fleeing first the Aryan vandals who brought them misery and then from the Arabs who brought them the choice of exile, death, or slavery. This unexpected trajectory proved to be the seeding of the medieval Christianity. Western law and ultimately the Western democracies and their teachings of human dignity. All the marks of special pro, uh, providence appear to cl classic Christian theologians to be embedded in this strange and surprising trajectory. There is little doubt that Irish Christianity strain, sustained strong African and monistic, monistic motive, motifs in its piety. Hagiography and temperament. This can be seen visually in its crosses, funerary objects, decor, calendars, and art forms, as well as literary, literarily in poetry, song, and preaching. But to establish this textually requires a thorough reassessment of received texts that are known but not yet adequately assessed critically as to their stemma and province. All this waits, much of it must be done in Ireland, a good place for emerging, emerging African scholars to consider for advanced studies in history. This is why a bold generation of dedicated scholarship is needed to join the dots together. If the links can be persuasively shown, the South to North hypotheses will spring more plausibly to life. If so, many related issues of African identity and African influence in Europe will be, will be need to reevaluate it will be needed to reevaluate it. Okay, that that's a that's that's a misprint right there. African intellectual history has no need to be defensive or self-effacing. We are learning that Africa taught Europe before Europe was prepared to teach Africa. Europe has slept for many centuries without being fully aware of its vital intellectual sources in Africa. A caveat against Afrocentric exaggeration. It would be a vast exaggeration to proclaim that African the theology became normative for all aspects of ancient ecumenical the Christianity, but it is not an exaggeration to say that African exegetical skills and competencies in interpreting the Old Testament provided the pattern by which Africans, especially origin, Augustine and Cyril supplied the scriptural basis for the dogmatic work of the Oikumene from the Cappadocians, Basil the Great, 
Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa, to Gregory the Great. This exegetical achievement was such that few aspects of early ecumenical the theology will be found t untouched by African exegesis. So if you ask, from what continent did the great fathers of ecumenical orthodoxy get to get the core of their scriptural interpretation? The answer has to be more of it comes from African text than European, assuming that the far southern southeastern reaches of Europe are Thrace and the Bosphorus. From where did John of Damascus get his, get his vision of orthodoxy? More from Athanasius and Cyril than any European. From where did Leo the Great get the Chalced Chalcedonian formulation? Y'all know what the Chalced Chalcedonian thing is. That's where what everything got decided, what goes into the Bible. The roots are most uh, mostly African, from the exegetes and the Nile and the Medjurda. The temptation to exaggerate is intrinsic to all scholarship. Rare is the scholar who does not think that his or her own subject matter of the utmost important. Okay, the temptation to exaggerate is intrinsic to all scholarship. Rare is the scholar who does not think his or her own subject matter is of the utmost, up, utmost importance. Historical influences are far easier to allege than to demonstrate. The study of the history begs for a humble and contrite heart. The Afrocentric exaggeration that has tainted this inquiry must be overcome by evidence. The challenge for young African scholars is to dig into these areas and examine the hypotheses suggested above to see indeed if they are defensible in terms of the evidence in terms of the evidence this is a great book guys i hope i'm not tearing it up too badly and this is the name of the book how africa shaped the christian mind mm -hmm. love the book you guys i hope you get this book and read it i know i'm tearing it up okay thank you fam bye